Looking back at the more obscure chapters have kind of been the most fun thing to do since HBO and George Martin haven't been putting out too much to discuss. It doesn't get more interesting than Jamie Lannister's obscure and possibly prophetic dream. It goes down in the middle of the third book of Storm of Swords, a little after he had his hand cut off. The lead up to the very strange and detailed dream makes it seem like it was caused by Jamie's fever and the intake of dream wine to help with the pain. But after he wakes, it's revealed to us with a lot of emphasis that the entire dream sequence took place while resting his head on a weirwood tree stump. And we know the magical ties with these plants. There's also the possible connection to the Three-Eyed Raven. During the first three books, Jamie is still portrayed as a villainous character. But as the story arc progressed, the more complex layers begin to show. He's on track to being a very vital character in the final battles, which I'm very much on board for. I along with many agree, Jamie is one of the best written characters in the story. I'm about to dive into the long quote, and as for a heads up, this is one of the longer dream sequences in the story. The only one that's longer I can think of off the top of my head is the iconic dream Bran has with the Thread Raven while still in his coma, way back in the early chapters of the first book. If you aren't into trying to decipher cryptic symbolism, this video here might not be for you. He closed his eyes and hoped to dream of Cersei. The fever dreams were all so vivid. Naked and alone he stood, surrounded by enemies, with stone walls all around him pressing close. The rock he knew. He could feel the immense weight of it above his head. He was home. He was home and whole. He held his right hand up and flexed his fingers to feel the strength in them. It felt as good as sex. As good as swordplay. Four fingers and a thumb. He had dreamed that he was maimed, but it wasn't so. Relief made him feel dizzy. My hand, my good hand. Nothing could hurt him so long as he was whole. Around him stood a dozen tall figures in cowled robes that hid their faces. In their hands were spears. Who are you? he demanded of them. What business do you have in Castle Rock? They gave him no answer, only prodded him with the points of their spears. He had no choice but to descend. Down a twisting passageway he went, narrow steps carved from the living rock, down and down. I must go up, he told himself. Up, not down. Why am I going down? Below the earth, his doom awaited, he knew with the certainty of dream. Something dark and terrible lurked there, something that wanted him. Jimmy tried to halt, but their spears prodded him on. If only I had my sword, nothing could harm me. The steps ended abruptly on echoing darkness. Jimmy had the sense of vast space before him. He jerked to a halt, teetering on the edge of nothingness. A spear point jabbed at the small of his back, shoving him into the abyss. He shouted, but the fall was short. He landed on his hands and knees, upon soft sand and shallow water. There were watery caverns deep below Castle Rock, but this one was strange to him. What place is this? Your place, the voice echoed. It was a hundred voices, a thousand. The voices of all the Lannisters since Lan the Clever, who'd lived at the dawn of days. But most of all, it was his father's voice. And beside Lord Tywin stood his sister, pale and beautiful, a torch burning in her hand. Joffrey was there as well, the sun they'd meet together. And behind them, a dozen more dark shapes with golden hair. Sister, why has father brought us here? Us? This is your place. This is your darkness. Her torch was the only light in the cavern. Her torch was the only light in the world. She turned to go. Stay with me, Jamie pleaded. Don't leave me here alone. But they were leaving. Don't leave me in the dark. Something terrible lived down here. Give me a sword at least. I gave you a sword, Lord Tywin said. It was at his feet. Jamie groped under the water until his hand closed upon the hilt. Nothing can hurt me so long as I have a sword. As he raised his sword, a finger of pale flame flickered at the point and crept along the edge, stopping a hand's breadth from the hilt. The fire took on the color of the steel itself, so it burned with a silvery blue light, and the gloom pulled back. Jamie moved in a circle, ready for anything that might come out of the darkness. The water flowed into his boots, ankle deep and bitterly cold. Beware the water, he told himself. There may be creatures living in it, hidden deep. Dreams become a small part of Jamie's story arc, beginning with this one, and there's always mention of his right hand, whether it's in the dream or not. There's only one case where he's without his dominant hand in a dream. Jamie's realization that his hand has returned to him just shows how much his identity was tied to his fighting capabilities. Everything changes the moment it's cut off, but when he had no sword, no confidence there. You can see how much others' perception of him deeply affects him, from the way his ancestors are literally talking down to him. 
His love and attachment towards his twin sister is shown by how much he wants her to stay by his side as opposed to the rest of the Lannister family. But then, a sword magically appears for him at his feet. A sword that happens to be on fire. The first thing your mind instantly goes to is the promised prince prophecy, who will save the world against the darkness. As exciting as this would be, I don't think Jaime will truly be a high class swordsman ever again. The promised prince should be either John or Danny. The whole promised prince prophecy that many characters believe and are expecting predicts that the hero will wield a burning sword, forged by driving a regular blade into his wife's heart. But the way visions and prophecies work in this series, this could all just be a metaphor. A burning sword could very well be a poetic way to refer to a dragon. Back to Jamie's dream. From behind came a great splash. Jamie whirled toward the sound, but the faint light revealed only Brienne of Tarth, her hands bound in heavy chains. I swore to keep you safe, the wench said stubbornly. I swore an oath. Naked, she raised her hands to Jamie. Sir, please, if you would be so good. The steel links parted like silk. A sword, Bran begged, and there it was. Scabbard, belt, and all. She buckled it around her thick waist. The light was so dim that Jamie could scarcely see her, though they stood a scant few feet apart. In this light, she could almost be a beauty, he thought. In this light, she could almost be a knight. Brienne's sword took flame as well, burning a silvery blue. The darkness retreated a little more. The flames will burn so long as you live, he heard Cersei call. When they die, so must you. Sister, he shouted. Stay with me. Stay. There was no reply but the soft sound of retreating footsteps. Brienne moved her long sword back and forth, watching the silvery flame shift and shimmer. Beneath her feet, a reflection of the burning blade shone on the surface of the flat black water. She was as tall and strong as he remembered. Yet it seemed to Jamie that she had more of a woman's shape now. Do they keep a bear down here? Brienne was moving, slow and wary, sword to hand. Step, turn, and listen. Each step made a little splash. A cave lion, dire wolves, some bear. Tell me, Jamie, what lives here? What lives in the darkness? Doom, no bear, he knew. No lion, only doom. In the cold, silvery blue light of the swords, the big wench looked pale and fierce. I mislike this place. I'm not fond of it myself. Their blades made a little island of light. But all around them stretched a sea of darkness, unending. My feet are wet. We could go back the way they brought us. If you climbed on my shoulders, you'd have no trouble reaching the tunnel mouth. Then I could follow Cersei. He could feel himself growing hard at the thought, and turned away so Brienne would not see. This is the birth of Jaime's interest in Brienne of Tarth, and as she enters his dream with a flaming sword of her own, Cersei slowly leaves it, kind of like how these relationships are developing. So this part of the dream kills the whole Jaime is the promised prince idea for me. The fire sword isn't unique to him if Brienne also has one. I think it just means she'll also have a huge role to play in the major conflicts up ahead. It makes much more sense for it to foreshadow the Valyrian steel sword that was given to Jaime, only for him to pass it on to the very much more deserving Brienne later in the book. The sword that he asked her to name Oathkeeper represents everything he wants to be and be viewed as. He still wants to keep his promise in rescuing the Stark girls. Using the Valyrian steel sword that was made for him is the only way he could think of accomplishing this goal. Valyrian steel swords are possibly made with dragonfire and magic, but no other character can confirm this as of yet, because the Valyrians are long gone. When Cersei points out that the fire going out would mean their death, this could mean that this weapon is their best chance for when the White Walkers bring in the Long Night. Dragonglass or obsidian weapons are effective, yes, but Valyrian steel is way more durable. Dragonglass will shatter if you drop it or hit a hard object like armor. As for Brienne's comments about a bear, a dire wolf, and a lion, those are kind of obvious. Her life currently revolves around the Starks and Lannisters, whose sigils are the dire wolf and lion. As for the bear, she'll come face to face with one trying to maul her to death. Just some foreshadowing going on. Which adds to this argument that this is no ordinary dream. Listen, she put a hand on his shoulder, and he trembled at the sudden touch. She's warm. Something comes, Brienne lifted her sword to point off to his left. There. He peered into the gloom until he saw it too. Something was moving in the darkness. He could not quite make it out. A man on a horse. No, two. Two riders side by side. Down here, beneath the rock, it made no sense. Yet came two riders on pale horses. Men and mounts, both armored. The destriers emerged from the blackness at a slow walk. 
They make no sound, Jamie realized. No splashing, no clink of mail, no clop of hoof. He remembered Eddard Stark riding the length of Ares' throne wrapped in silence. Only his eyes had spoken, the Lord's eyes, cold and grey, and full of judgment. Is it you, Stark? Jamie called. Come ahead, I never feared you living, I do not fear you dead. Brienne touched his arm, there are more. He saw them too, they were armored all in snow, it seemed to him, and ribbons of mist swirled back from their shoulders. The visors of their helms were closed, but Jamie did not need to look upon their faces to know them. Five had been his brothers. Oswald Went, John Dari, Lewin Martell, Prince of Dorne, the White Bull, Gerald Hightower, Sir Arthur Dane, Sir the Morning, and beside them, crowned in mist and grief, with his long hair, streaming behind him, rode Rhaegar Targaryen, Prince of Dragonstone, and rightful heir to the throne. You don't frighten me, he called, turning as they split to either side of him. He did not know which way to face. I will fight you one by one or all together. But who is there for the ones to duel? She gets cross when you leave her out. I swore an oath to keep him safe, she said to Rhaegar Shade. I swore a holy oath. We all swore oaths, said Arthur Dane, so sadly. The shades dismounted from their ghostly horses. When they drew their long swords, it made no sound. He was going to burn the city, Jamie said, to leave Robert only ashes. He was your king, said Dari. You swore to keep him safe, said Went. And the children, them as well, said Prince Lewin. Prince Rhaegar burned with a cold light, now white, now red, now dark. I left my wife and children in your hands. I never thought he'd hurt them. Jamie's sword was burning, less brightly now. I was with the king. Killing the king, said Sir Arthur. Cutting his throat, said Prince Lewin. The king you had sworn to die for, said the white bull. The fires that ran along the blade were guttering out. And Jamie remembered what Cersei had said. No, Tara closed the hand around his throat. Then his sword went dark, and only Brienne's burned, as the ghosts came rushing in. No, he said. No, 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 no. Heart pounding, he jerked awake, and found himself in starry darkness amidst a grove of trees. The inner struggle within Jamie is fully revealed in this last part of the dream. The people he admired most in the world all died in the same war 15 years back. Robert's rebellion crossed the Targaryen dynasty, and the only surviving members of the Mad King's Kingsguard were Sir and Selmy and Jamie. Jamie being the only one to not set foot on a battlefield. Not because he didn't want to, but because the Mad King wanted him by his side at all times as a sort of hostage against his father, Tywin. This group of Kingsguard had achieved everything Jamie wanted. The people loved them. They were the story's best fighters and lived honorably. Jamie's reputation is arguably worse than Rhaegar's, who's partially responsible for starting the whole rebellion after running off with Lyanna Stark. Jamie's only remembered as the Kingslayer, the man who slit the throat of the old man he swore to protect. How they would view his decisions clearly haunts him to this day. Or a perfectly placed reminder by the Thread Raven to steer Jamie onto the right path. With Brienne still fresh on his mind, Jamie convinces his captors to save Brienne from this future bear. His redemption arc begins with this dream, and he hasn't pushed the young child out of a window since. But right after this dream, Jamie can't keep his eyes off the stump where he rested his head on while asleep. The moonlight glimmered pale upon the stump where Jamie had rested his head. The moss covered it so thickly he had not noticed before, but now he saw that the wood was white. With all of this emphasis on a stump, it's safe to say some green seer magic was responsible for the vision. In the next book, Jamie would have another strange dream where he is visited by his late mother, Joanna Lannister, and again, the judgment for his actions cuts Jamie deep. In this dream, she successfully convinces Jamie that this is no dream at all, possibly some more magic. By this point in the story, he's almost completely free from Cersei's grip, and then Brienne enters his life again. Jamie being approached by Brienne in the last of their chapters is a bigger cliffhanger than Jon getting stabbed, or Daenerys surrounded by Dothraki could ever be. I actually have no idea how he'll get out of the situation with Lady Stoneheart, while Jon's death is an easy thing to get around. Danny's situation with the Dothraki herd even easier. The show writers at Game of Thrones showed us how small of a hurdle those plot lines were in comparison. Jamie's in store to play a big role, but being the promised prince is a stretch that I'm not buying. If you guys have any different theories, I'd love to hear it. But otherwise, I'll see y'all next week. Thanks for watching.